And just like that, she appears. Hello, hello, spooky lovelies. Hello to everyone who is watching. I am the human embodiment of a spooky roller disco, um, as well as the future ghost with the most. Vivian, that's me. Hi, everyone. Hello to everyone who is joining. And welcome to a mini murder episode because I'm still working on the final part for the cults episode. Promise you guys it's going to be good. There's just a lot of material to cover with that last one. So it may be a two-parter. I don't know yet. But as of right now, it's about an hour long in and of itself without any commentary. So uh, trying to put together a masterwork to finish off that cults series. But in the meantime, while I work on that, I have no problem cranking out these mini episodes Um here and there. Apologies for the tail that is in front of the camera. You may see it every once in a while. There it is. Um, that is my cat Luna. It is her birthday today and apparently she decided that she wanted to join the stream because it is her birthday and she'll cry if she wants to. I was hoping for a cry on cue but that's not really working. Um, so this episode is actually like one that maybe not a lot of people know. Uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved did cover it. It's been covered by a few other things. Um, it was covered by request um, from Amy, who is uh, Anne Marie, who is a lovely haunted side fan. My cat's butthole does not need to be on camera. I, there's the cry if I want to. So this was episode was requested by Amy, uh, daughter of Anne Marie, who's a lovely fan of the haunted side. Hashtag spooky fam. Um, she requested this episode be covered specifically um, because it is a case that interests her and it's a pretty good case to cover. Um, so hello to everybody who is joining, um, working on, we'll just wait a couple, another minute or so for more people to trickle in as it is. And you might see the, you know, there she is, birthday girl. <laughs> hey Max, hey Polly, hey Janine, hey Victoria, hey Tamara, hey to anybody I missed. But um, yeah, this one's not as would we'll try to cover is, oh, Luna, that's a very good question. I said it's her birthday. How rude of me. Uh, it's her birthday and I didn't even tell y'all how old she is. Uh, so Luna is 11. She's 11. I know. She's 11 today. Hi, honey. She hated that. Oh, Luna, stop it. My, uh, one of my other cats is up here as well. So she is very spicy right now because he is near her. So without further ado, um, kind of playing with some more editing techniques with this one to see if, what do you guys think? We're playing with some, uh, some fun little edits on my editing software. And I think I'm getting pretty decent at this. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's get started, shall we? Oop, hold on. Between the years of 1935 to 1938, a monster stalked the streets of Cleveland. A serial killer who mutilated and dismembered at least 13 victims, only three of which were ever positively identified. A serial killer whose true identity to this day remains unknown. And much like his Victorian era counterpart, Jack the Ripper, is known only by the pseudonym that the horrified press and public gave him at the time. The Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, or more famously, the Cleveland Torso Killer. During the 1930s, while the rest of the United States suffered and struggled through the aches and pains of a Great Depression, Cleveland, Ohio was a city on the rise. One of the hearts of the steel industry, as well as the home of numerous manufacturing plants, it was a city that drew people en masse to support the massive need for labor. It seemed the hardest times that the nation faced were in the rear view, and yet it wasn't such a walk in the park for everyone. The underbelly of this thriving city was the neighborhood of Kingsbury Run, the seedy home of the disenfranchised that most tried to forget. And it was there 
that a reign of shock and terror would unfold over the span of three years and would stop as suddenly as it had started, leaving an entire city reeling in the wake of an unknown force of pure evil. The I'm so dramatic in my vocals. Um, yeah, it, things looked very dreary because they were very dreary. This was in the height of the Great Depression um, in the mid thirties, things were not, um, they were, yeah, they were not funky fresh. They were, they were not at all. Uh, things were pretty crummy. The area that is particularly honed in on by this killer was, um, a very poor area of town. A lot of homeless people, a lot of transients. Um, so basically victims that were, for all intents and purposes, really hard to track. And most of them didn't have identification. And, you know, unless they had been arrested for crimes, most were just kind of, you know, unknown people, um, just kind of blowing in the wind. And cats. So you'll kind of see why that kind of comes into play here in, in a little bit when we start getting into the killings. Um, and this is perhaps a reason that the, maybe the, the, the reason that the killer honed in on this particular area because there were plentiful victims and nobody would really go looking for these people, unfortunately. The uh, crime scenes are pretty bad. I'm going to preface this with there are actual crime scene photos in this show. So uh, please do be warned. There is some graphic content ahead. You have been warned. Continue me. The area of Kingsbury Run was a dangerous and dreary place during the 1930s. Not only was it home to train and transit tracks, but a sprawling hobo jungle sprang up in the area. Populated mostly by transients who rode the rails in order to escape the harsh Midwestern winters and to seek out their fortunes and the few jobs that were on offer for those willing to work. The area just east of the run was not much of an improvement. Known as the Roaring Third, it was home to flop houses, brothels, bars, and gambling dens. It was in the backdrop of this hard scrabble and desperation that the most notorious murder case in Cleveland begins to unfold. According to some experts, the terror would actually begin in September 1934 with a grisly discovery on the shores of Lake Erie. A young man came across the remains of a female victim in the form of the lower half of a torso with thighs still attached but legs amputated at the knees. According to Cuyahoga County Coroner A.J. Pierce, some chemical agent had been poured on the skin as a makeshift preservative, turning it red and leathery. A subsequent search only turned up a few more body parts, but the head was never recovered. The woman is never identified, known only as the Lady in the Lake. It wasn't until a year later that the killings would officially begin, according to others, and it was two years following that the Lady in the Lake would be included in the official victim count due to... I can hold that thought for a second. Um, that is an actual, um, yes, that is an actual morgue photo of the remains of the victim known as the Lady of the Lake, which is... She was not originally counted in the um, original victims. Uh, it was only thought to be 12. But then when they went back and they, you know, looked back and they were like, wow, the motive is really the same. And she matches the MO of a lot of the other victims. They basically ended up going back and dubbing her victim zero, uh, which pushed the count to 13. Um, and that is, yeah, it doesn't even look human anymore. That looks like something you'd find in a butcher shop. So pretty mangled, pretty uh, pretty bad, and uh, it, it does not improve. So th we're, we're starting here. Guy's the limit. Continue. Similarities in her injuries and dismemberment with other official victims. Almost exactly a year later, in September 1935, 
two teenage boys would discover a mutilated body of a white male at the base of Jackass Hill, where East 49th Street backs up into Kingsbury Run. The body had been decapitated and nude, save for a pair of socks, and there were rope burns on both wrists. The body was clean, but it was drained of all of its blood. The victim's genitals had also been cut off and removed. Fingerprints identified the victim as 28-year-old Edward Andrasi. Coroner Pierce determined that the cause of death was decapitation. Andrasi had an arrest record and was rumored to be a homosexual and frequented the Roaring Third often. A second body was discovered nearby, also decapitated and emasculated. The body was also covered in the same chemical preservative as the Lady in the Lake. The body of the 40-year-old second victim was never identified. It sure wasn't. And yes, Sarah Jane, that was absolutely 100% a real photo series of Edward Andrasi. The first one was a photo of his body found at the foot of the hill. And the other one was his decapitated head, which was recovered uh, not too far from the original scene. So the cause of death, and you did hear that correctly, the cause of death was actually decapitation. So that means the person was alive. So Edward Andrasi was unfortunately alive when he was decapitated. And that was the cause of death. A lot of times when you see dismemberment killers, um, a lot of times you'll see them dismember the body after the person's been killed by some other method, either by strangulation, poison, uh, gunshot. They'll kill them one way and then they will take the body apart to in order to dispose of it. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case for Edward Andrasi. Uh, he met his end with his head being chopped off. So not a, uh, not a sane, not a normal and sane person. We're, we're starting out, we, yeah, we're starting out strong out the gate um, with, with this one. <laughs> How's your head? Haven't had any complaints. Uh, otherwise, continue me. The streets were quiet through the holidays, outside of the normal lawless brouhaha that came with the wild side of the Roaring Third. Business seemed back to usual and people felt free to indulge in their vices. The random murders seemed to have stopped. That is, until a grisly discovery one cold day in January of 1936. A woman came upon the remains of a female victim, cut up and wrapped in newspaper before being placed in two half-bushel baskets. The baskets were left outside of the Hart Manufacturing Building on Central Avenue near 20th Street. Everything but the victim's head was recovered ten days later in an empty lot on nearby Orange Avenue. Again, the cause of death, as with victim Edward Andrasi, had been decapitation. Strangely, though, it appeared that the killer had waited for rigor mortis to set into the body before dismantling it and discarding the pieces. Fingerprints would identify the third victim as barmaid, waitress, prostitute, and fixture of the Roaring Third, Florence Flo Pillillo. It was determined that she had been dead for about two to four days before her remains were found. A few months later in June, on one early summer morning in Kingsbury Run, two boys would come across the severed head of a white male wrapped in a pair of white trousers close to the Hold on for a second, me. Yes, that is an actual, another severed head. Just when you thought you wouldn't see one severed head today. No, no, no. I'm going to up the game. We're going to raise the bar. I'll raise that and show you two severed heads tonight. That is an actual severed head of the fourth victim who does not have a name um, and goes by the tattooed man. So uh, continue me. Uh, Sarah, we will get there. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, there's some interesting suspects in this one. Um, one that was definitely not, sh should not have been a suspect at all. And one that probably did it, but unfortunately cannot be proven to this point. So the East 55th street bridge. The next day, 
police would find the headless body of a 20-something-year-old white male dumped unceremoniously outside the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. The body was clean and drained of blood, much like in the first few victims. It was also determined that he had been decapitated while still alive. Despite a fresh set of fingerprints and at least six distinct tattoos located on the victim's body, police couldn't seem to confirm the identity of the victim. A plaster death mask of the victim, plus reproductions of his tattoos, were created for display at the Great Lakes Exposition of 1936 in hopes of encountering a relative or someone who recognized the victim, known only as the Tattooed Man. Approximately 100,000 people saw the mask and the tattoo chart at the exposition, but despite these efforts, the Tattooed Man was never identified. His death mask, along with three others made from other victims in the case, are still on display at the Cleveland Police Museum. Yes, those that is a picture of the Cleveland Police Museum with the Torso Murders exhibit that is still there. Those are the death masks in question. Um, the one, I believe... One of them is an identified victim. The other ones were not identified. Um, so yeah, yeah, just plaster death masks like staring at you from the wall. That's not disturbing. I mean, honestly, like that's probably the least disturbing thing in this case so far are rubber death masks. The bar set pretty high when the least disturbing thing is masks of dead people. Continue me. One month later, in July 1936, a teenage girl came across the decapitated remains of a 40-year-old white male while walking through the woods. The victim had been dead for about two months by the time he was discovered. His head, as well as a pile of bloody clothes, were also found at the scene. The amount of blood that had been found seeped into the ground beneath the body, in contrast to the other cleaned and drained victims, showed that the man had not been transported and dumped, but had been killed where his body was found. He also remained unidentified, and is known only as the West Side victim. But there was no doubt, with two killings this close together, the killer was becoming bolder in his actions. In September of the same year, a transient tripped over the upper half of a man's discarded torso while attempting to hop a train at East 37th Street in Kingsbury Run. Police searched a nearby open sewer and discovered the lower half of the torso along with parts of both legs. A diver was sent in to recover the parts. Over 600 people gathered to witness the spectacle of fishing the man's parts from the fetid water, and the killer himself may have well been among them, watching the police appreciate his handiwork. The male victim was in his late 20s and had again been killed by being decapitated while alive. Coroner Pierce noted the lack of hesitation in the disarticulation marks on the body. This indicated a killer who was well-versed in human anatomy. The head had also been taken off in one clean stroke. The victim, who fortunately died instantly from these savage wounds, was also never identified. This made the sixth brutal murder in about a year's time, and the police had neither clues nor any suspects. Which that seems like two things that they should have at this point. Clues, suspects. You have six dead people, heads removed, in pieces, sprinkled all over Kingsbury Run like this guy was playing some sort of morbid Easter egg hunt. And they're like, yeah, I got nothing. I, I, mm, hmm. Yeah, mm, I don't know. Disarticulation, that is a great word. So yes, the coroner, original coroner on the case, because he was replaced at a later at a later point, he was voted out of office, um, did note during the autopsies that for the most part, when these bodies were dismembered, it was very like precise. This person knew what they were doing. So either they had some sort of medical training 
and a medical background and they knew about anatomy or they could have been a butcher um, because butchers would be also very familiar with taking a a carcass apart because that is part of their job. Uh, Fun fact also about butchers, uh, butchers were for like the longest time, I don't know if that's true anymore. The butchers for the longest time were not allowed to serve on juries, especially in death penalty cases. They were actually like eliminated from jury duty for those because they were considered to be too, their profession was considered to be too cold and too cruel. Uh, to have any empathy or sympathy for the plaintiff on trial. So, yeah, please (laughs) rubbish. I mean, it was kind of the Keystone Cops, honestly. Like, I will say they did try. They tried because they interviewed a lot of people. But also at the same time, I feel like because the victims were mostly transient people um, and mostly vagrants, I I don't know how hard they actually looked. You know, um, these people were basically undesirable, considered undesirables at the time anyway, and they're hard to track. They're hard to, you know, pin down to one place, hard to identify. Most people didn't, you know, that you didn't have ID cards back then. And like I said, unless you were arrested for something um, and they had your fingerprints on file, chances are pretty good. They're not going to find out who you were um, at all. So continue me. Let's find out what the police do next. Here's a hint. It's not a lot. The local papers, including the Cleveland News, the Cleveland Press, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer, all reported daily on the grisly string of murders, as well as the lack of any leads or suspects by police in the case. Tensions were growing high. A city sat in fear, and the unanswered question on every frightened citizen's mind was the same. Who was the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run? Under immense pressure from the public to try to pin down a suspect, Mayor Harold Burton would place recently appointed safety director and famous G-man of the Untouchables, Elliot Ness, in charge of the direction of the Torso Murders investigation. Coroner Pierce also called for what some in the press dubbed a torso clinic, or a meeting of minds for the police, the coroner, and others to share details about the case and to develop a profile of whom their suspect might be. The Cleveland police would also place detectives Peter Merlow and Martin Zalewski on the case full time. They would go undercover, dressed as vagrants or transients, and carefully navigate the dreaded hobo jungles of the Roaring Third. Moving seamlessly through this grimy underworld, they interviewed the regulars in the area in hopes to spark some leads, often on their own time. At the conclusion of the investigation, the two detectives had themselves interviewed over 1,500 people, and the police department as a whole had interviewed about 5,000 in regards to the case. This would be... Hold on for a second, me. Um, Yes, it could be another musical, The Demon Butcher of Kingsbury. I feel it. I feel it. Uh, I wrote the music for this episode, so I am down to uh, write a musical about the Cleveland Torso Killer. I feel feel like it is woefully overdue. Um, And then Sarah Jane said, Elliot Ness, where do I know that name from? Well, Sarah Jane, Elliot Ness was a very famous, uh, they called him G-Men, FBI agent, top cop of his day back then uh, as part of the Untouchables. He was part of a police unit that would go raid um, illegal liquor distributors, moonshiners, bootleggers during prohibition. Um, so that was what his claim to fame was. He was very famous for that. Um, it was a very famous lawman in his day, uh, notoriously incorruptible, couldn't be bribed, which happened a lot back then. Um, so there's that, I mean, probably the hobo stick, right? The stick with the bindle on it. I was like, I feel like here's the thing with that photo with him, like dressed up with the little hat with the stick and the bag on it. I feel like that's like a, almost like a caricature or a cartoon of a hobo at the time. Like that really seems like to me, a cop trying not to be pegged as a cop. Like, hello, hobo. Hello, fellow hobos. I am also a hobo. Clearly, you can see by my bag on a stick. I feel like that was like something they did in cartoons, but I don't know if they actually did that in real life. 
it just smacks very much of like narc to me where it's like you know the the cop that tries to like approach the <laughs> hello fellow youths you can see by my jeans that i am also a fellow youth may i have one drug please like it, it's it's a little on the nose i i don't know like i don't know a little costumey maybe he was all about costumes i don't know maybe he was very dramatic and just was like no i need to get in character it's method acting give me a very stinky bindle stinky bindle that's a good punk punk band name actually continue me be the biggest police investigation in Cleveland history. November elections would come and go, keeping Harold Burton in place as mayor, but the coroner would be replaced by the now legendary Sam Gerber, who with his passion for medicine and his degree in law, placed himself at the forefront of the ongoing investigation. And despite all the man hours and time placed in interviewing witnesses or profiling suspects, the killings hadn't stopped. In February 1937, a man found the upper half of a woman's torso in nearly the same spot along the Lake Erie shore as the original Lady in the Lake. Unlike the other victims, though, the cause of death was not decapitation, as this had been determined to have taken place after her death. The lower half of her torso would wash ashore a month later. She was in her mid-twenties and was never identified. In June, a teenage boy would discover a human skull beneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. Next to it was a burlap sack containing the skeletal remains of a petite African-American woman about 40 years of age. Dental records would allow for an unofficial identification as Rose Wallace of Scoville Avenue. Police followed every lead they could find on the woman, but they ultimately hit a dead end. One month later, labor tensions in the industrial area known as the Flats caused the National Guard to be sent in in order to quell riots. A guardsman standing watch at the West 3rd Street Bridge saw the first piece of victim number 9 float by in the wake of a passing tugboat. Over the next few days, police recovered the entire body, except for the head, from the Cuyahoga River. The abdomen had been sliced open and gutted, and the heart ripped out, indicating a new level of cruelty and viciousness in the killer's approach to mutilating his victims, perhaps a component of rage directed at this particular victim, or as an overall statement to those chosen by the killer. The man was in his mid to late thirties, and was never identified. The rest of 1937 remained quiet. Perhaps the killer had moved on or had shrunken back into the shadows for whatever reason following the butchery of victim number nine. Perhaps he felt the police might be catching on and decided to lay low for a time. Whatever the reason for the eye in the storm, the peace would not last. In April of 1938, a young laborer was on his way to work in the flats when he saw at first what he thought was a dead fish on the banks of the Cuyahoga River. It turned out to be the lower half of a woman's leg, the first part of victim number 10. A month later, police pulled two burlap bags from the river that contained both parts of the torso and most of the rest of the legs. During a post-mortem examination, Coroner Gerber determined that the victim had drugs in her system. This was the first time drugs had been found in any of the Kingsbury Run victims' bodies. Had the drug been used to immobilize her, or had she been an addict taken off the street? The answer to that might have come if they managed to locate her arms, but they never did. She was never identified. Sorry, I had to mute that for a second because my cat decided that she was going to chime in at that very moment and sing us the song of her people because she's like, don't forget it's my birthday. I can be as loud as I want. Um, yeah, like just find a leg, just a, just a, can you imagine that somebody's like, oh man, like there's a dead fish that no, that is not a fish at all. That is, that is, that is a leg. That fish has a foot. I'm calling someone. Not okay. Um, yeah, so also somebody said Jason and Vivian debate. Yes, honestly, like you get like Jason, especially us talking about movies. Holy crap, like 
we could we could you guys would get bored and we would just like sit there and talk for hours and we would just like go back and forth so it's fun um you're just like and it's not even the whole leg though that's the crazy part because it's obviously it was small enough to be mistaken for a fish so it was like from the calf down to the foot and somebody was just like oh weird that's a that's a weird looking fish that's that's not that's not what that is that's not what that is at all like i love the ones that always why is it always a mannequin that was my question anytime you ever watch these true crime shows anybody that finds a dead body what is the first thing they always say i thought it was a mannequin like out in the field like bitch who is buying mannequins and just throwing them around willy-nilly all over the countryside those things are expensive like no no uh-uh i don't think so continue me with every move, the killer seemed to be continuing to laugh in the face of the authorities who tried in vain to track him down. Even the top cop at the time, Elliot Ness, was left scratching his head, but was still determined to catch the fiend who was terrorizing the city. Ness's reputation of being a spotless and incorruptible lawman seemed to draw the ire of the unknown killer, who would very soon make a bold statement seemingly directed at Ness himself. On August 16, 1938, three scrap collectors were foraging in a dump site at East 9th and Lakeside when they discovered the torso of a woman wrapped in a man's double-breasted blue blazer, then wrapped again in an old quilt. The legs and arms were discovered nearby in a neatly constructed box wrapped in brown butcher paper and sealed with rubber bands. The head was also wrapped in a similar fashion, as if it was a macabre gift. Coroner Gerber noticed that some of the parts appeared as if they had been stored in refrigeration or preserved in cold for some period of time. While they sought out more of the pieces of victim 11, the body of victim number 12 was discovered only yards away. In adding insult to injury, both of these victims had been placed in a location that was conspicuously in full view from Elliot Ness's office window. You heard that correctly. Is if that wasn't the biggest middle finger that somebody could pull to a cop who is investigating the same case that you are committing crimes on, I am going to leave the last two victims directly in view of his offices like he could look out the window and across the street was this lot where these bodies were found they were left within eye shot that was literally the pew, pew, double barrel like that is brassy that is brassy that is bold i'll give him that whoever this was he is he's a he is a brassy motherfucker. Like, that is for sure. Like, yeah, cocky. I mean, yeah, obviously, like, he's got, like, a sick sense of humor for sure. Like, or it was just the the come get me. What are you going to do about it? He was he was definitely, definitely feeling himself for sure. The double barrel. Pew, pew. Continuing. Neither of the victims were ever identified. Seemingly fed up with the constant dead ends and the case getting nowhere, Ness would take matters into his own hands on August 18th. At 12.40 a.m., Ness and a group of 35 officers would raid the hobo jungles of the run. Eleven squad cars, two fire trucks, and two police vans would descend like a swift wind on the large cluster of makeshift shacks and shanties. Ness's men worked their way through the maze of ramshackle settlements, eventually gathering up 63 men. At dawn, police and firemen would search the now-abandoned shanties for clues. Then, on orders from safety director Elliot Ness, the shacks were set on fire, and the entire shantytown burned to the ground. The men gathered up were then arrested for vagrancy and taken into custody. The press would excoriate Ness for his draconian tactics. Critics would say that the raid would do nothing to stop the murders, but for whatever reason, the killing stopped. 
So the place being burned had nothing to do with the killing stopping. This was a whole other coincidence that was in the play in the background, but let's revisit that for a second. As if to add insult to injury, you've got this whole area of homeless people that basically live in tents. It's a tent city, um, you know, shacks that they piece together with all of their worldly possessions in them, by the way, like everything that they own. And you send police through there because you're frustrated and you can't get anywhere in the case. And you're like, screw it. If I take away his victim base, then he can't kill anyone anymore. So they round up all of the homeless people and burn their houses to the ground, <laughs> destroy what little things they do have and then go, exactly. And then they go, well, since you're technically homeless now, exactly. Uh, we're going to arrest you for vagrancy since uh, they're like, but wait, I had a house. I had a tent. And they're like, where? <laughs> oh, and that pile of ashes over there. Well, okay. Yeah, you're going to jail. So that was pretty much his strategy. Like, that's what he came up with. And I was like, you could tell that that was a midnight. That was a long thought out 3 a.m. plan that he was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to burn it down. I'm just going to burn it down. And yeah, if I take away all the hobos, he can't kill any more hobos, which you right, but like, that's still messed up. Like, that's not cool. Of the 13 total victims, only three were ever positively identified and police were still left scratching their heads over a suspect. But in July 1939, for whatever reason, County Sheriff Martin O'Donnell would hone in on bricklayer Frank Dolezal for the murder of victim number three, Flo Palillo. Dolezal had lived with Palillo for a time, and a subsequent investigation turned up the fact that he also knew victims Edward Andrasi and Rose Wallace. Dolezal was arrested after he reportedly confessed to the crimes, but it turned out that most of that supposed confession, a telling blend of incoherent ramblings contrasting with neat, precise details, had been coerced while in custody. The lead detective in the case would even say in his later memoirs, quote, This is the first time that I've ever known anyone to confess to a crime that he didn't know the details of the crime to which he was confessing, unquote. But the Cleveland torso killing case would claim one final yet unofficial victim, Frank Dolezal. Before he could go to trial for the murders, Dolezal was found dead in his cell under mysterious circumstances. In what some would call perhaps the clumsiest police cover-up of all time, the suspect had apparently hanged himself in his cell. However, questions remain of how the 5'8 Dolezal would successfully hang himself from a hook only 5'7 inches off the floor. A post-mortem examination would show that Dolezal had also suffered six broken ribs, all while in police custody. It is uncertain why Sheriff O'Donnell had honed in on Dolezal as a suspect, since he is not thought to be a suspect by any experts in the case, even to this day. He is certainly not. Um, yeah, physically that does not work. Can anyone explain to me why that's physically like, like the man is five foot eight. The hook he hung himself from was five feet, seven inches off the ground. So the hook was actually shorter than he was tall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, like, so it's, it's well thought that he, uh, not only was he beaten while he was in custody and a confession was coerced out of him uh, during this process. Um, also Miranda rights weren't in place at the time. Those did not uh, become law until 1957. So you could be held like for as long as you wanted and they could basically just beat a confession out of you, which I think is what happened. I think they basically, he looked good. They honed in on him because he had a strange connection to a few of the victims or he, he lived in the area and he knew a few of them. So they were like, yep, that's the guy. Look, he says he did it. And like, yeah, well, six broken ribs will kind of make you do that. 
the only yeah the only other way he could have potentially done it from the hook if he'd have hung himself would be if he uh, dropped to his knees and like leaned completely forward. You can make it work, but to my knowledge, that is not the position he was found in. So definitely raises some red flags. That's all I'm going to say about that. Perhaps it was the desperation to solve a high-profile crime that caused him to accuse a man only tangentially associated with some of the victims. Either way, it almost certainly cost an innocent man his life. Cuyahoga Community College professor and author Dr. James J. Badal, who has researched the Cleveland Torso killings for two decades, is confident that Dolezal was an innocent victim of circumstance. Quote, Frank Dolezal was not the mad butcher, nor did he commit suicide, Dr. Badal said. He made three confessions, none of them held up. Unquote. Badal said he was so confident about his findings that the Police Historical Society later commissioned a headstone to mark Dolezal's previously unmarked grave. As perhaps a long overdue absolvement of accusations and a clearing of his name, the stone reads simply, Rest now. But outside of Dolezal, were there any other suspects in the infamous crimes? Yes one that Elliot Ness himself interviewed, who Ness himself also privately named as his prime suspect in 1938. His name was Francis Sweeney. Make that Dr. Francis Sweeney. Born May 5, 1894, Sweeney was a veteran of World War I who was part of a medical unit that conducted amputations in the field. In 1938, Sweeney was personally interviewed by Elliot Ness for 10 to 14 straight days in a hotel room, where the alcoholic Sweeney took three solid days to sober up enough to even answer questions. During this interrogation, Sweeney is said to have, quote, failed to pass two very early polygraph tests. Both tests were administered by polygraph expert Leonard Keeler, who pointedly told Ness he had his man. This, while not a violation of Miranda rights, which were not in place at the time, was a violation of civil liberties and could be considered an illegal interrogation. Ness also apparently felt that there was little chance of obtaining a successful prosecution of the doctor, especially since he was the first cousin of one of Ness's political opponents, Congressman Martin L. Sweeney, who had hounded Ness publicly about his failure to catch the killer. Sweeney was ultimately released by Ness, as he seemed to have insufficient evidence to make charges against him. Less than three months after Sweeney's release, the two final victims were disposed of pointedly across the street from Ness's offices. This is all circumstantial evidence, but I'm really leaning on the fact that this guy did that shit. Like... And wait, there's more. There's it, there's more to this. So a few other details that he was married at the time. He was uh, he had a wife, but his wife had taken him to probate court a few times for alcoholism, neglect of his medical practice, um, as well as so he was a frequent, you know, patron of the Roaring Third because he was an alcoholic. He would go to the bars there a lot. So he was familiar with the area. Um, he prowled that area quite frequently, as a matter of fact, to the detriment of his own practice, which basically closed. And his wife left him because of his alcoholism and his physical abuse of herself and their sons. Also, there was somebody who survived and escaped, managed to escape uh, somebody who is later thought to be the Cleveland Torso Killer. He was a homeless vagrant who frequented Kingsbury Run and he said a man picked him up and offered him to get drinks and offered to buy him drugs and things like that. So he went with him. And next thing he know, he ends up at an office and the guy is drugging him and he definitely senses something is wrong. He leaves. He's basically half out of it and just runs and bolts out of the office and went to the police and said, hey, this guy tried to do something weird. I don't know if he tried to like... I think he might was trying to maybe kill me or something. And the police drove him around and he swore that the building was on 
these two cross streets. Well, they drove him around and he couldn't find it. He couldn't find the building. He couldn't manage to pinpoint it. But turns out that um, the address that he gave was actually where Francis Sweeney's medical practice was at. Uh, also at the basement of the building that he operated in was basically a coroner's office. So he had basically the ability to take a body down there. He could take someone up to the his medical office, drug them, incapacitate them, and take them downstairs where they had dissection tables readily available for him to drain blood, disarticulate bodies, and put them into like, you know, bags and things like that and quickly dispose of them out the back into an alley where nobody would see it. I'm really thinking this guy did that shit, but continue. This is uh, also, there's more there. So there's more. So not only did once he was released, did the last two victims then get dumped outside of Ness's office, but then there was this. Not long after, Sweeney would commit himself to a mental institution, and coincidentally, the killings in Kingsbury Run stopped. And there were no more leads or connections that police could assign to him as a possible suspect. From his hospital confinement, Sweeney would continue to send threatening postcards and harass Ness and his family into the 1950s. Sweeney died in a veterans hospital in Dayton, Ohio, on July 9, 1964. Well, that didn't take me long to come back. So if you guys go back to that map and freeze frame on it, that is a map of where all the victims were found and where Fran uh, Francis Sweeney's house was at. So pretty much in the neighborhood, he was in the vicinity of where all the bodies were found. Um, and also he, after he was committed or committed himself to the institution, the murders mysteriously stopped. Had nothing to do with the fact, again, had nothing to do with the fact that they burned the hobo jungle down had everything to do probably with the fact that Sweeney committed himself. Also, uh, he would continue until like the 1950s to send Ness taunting postcards in the mail, or at least it was somebody that claimed to be Francis Sweeney, but like who would do that? Like, I feel like it was probably him sending these weird nonsensical rambling postcards to Ness basically like, as if to say like, you know I did it, I know I did it, but you're never going to catch me. So there's that. Continue me. The Kingsbury Run murders remain one of the most perplexing cases in our nation's criminal history. All official police records in the case have either been lost, destroyed, or removed. And while Sweeney remains a strong prime suspect in the case, the truth will likely never be known nor will the remaining unknown 10 victims likely ever be identified. Overall, for now the mystery of the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run and the Cleveland Torso Killings remains unsolved. And we're back. Okay, so I don't know, what do y'all think? I tend to think that it was Francis Sweeney that was Ness's prime suspect. Um, that was the actual killer. But unfortunately, like I said, with there were there was no forensic evidence at the uh, you know science at the time, um, and everybody obviously is long dead at this point. So there's really no way to prove that. So I'm pretty I'm leaning definitely in that direction. But unfortunately, there's no concrete evidence. And I think like what the saddest thing about it is like it's not even the fact that it wasn't there was nobody officially caught and prosecuted and tried for these crimes. Um, it's the fact that there are 10 victims that no one will ever know who those people were. Uh, only three of the 13 were identified and there are 10 people out there. They were all humans, men and women both, um, that no one will ever know who they were. And there's no name that goes with those people. That's very sad. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like a, a really kind of, sorry to kind of end it on a bummer, but <laughs> yeah, Polly's like, funny how it all stopped when he went to the hospital. Weird, right? I know, coincidental. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in coincidences. Not especially when it's like, there's that mountain of evidence. It's like, there's a lot of, and it, again, it's all circumstantial, no actual fingerprints, no blood evidence. They didn't like find, you know, knives and shit at his house or stuff like that. Like, or at least I don't think they did. They didn't find any like 
concrete evidence of like, you definitely did this. We found a decapitated hobo's head in your closet. So yeah, but I'm pretty sure he did that shit. Like, why would you taunt somebody from like the hospital? Like if you didn't do it and you were innocent, even if you were crazy, like why would you continue to taunt the person who thinks you did this into basically saying like, like you can't get me. I totally did it. Um, hopefully, I don't know. So yeah, those people were never identified and it's been long enough where they probably won't ever be, which is really sad. Also, uh, side note, they do think that perhaps there was another underlying motive because a lot of the male victims were, um, emasculated or their genitals were cut off and removed. They do think it was perhaps because Sweeney was rumored to be a bisexual and it may have been some sort of like sexually motivated crime. And that's why the victims were both men and women, which is odd for a killer. Usually they have like one victim type and they will hone in on that, whether that be male or female or, or whatever. Um, so they do think that that's very unusual that he went after. It didn't really seem to matter. Um, probably whoever approached him or whoever he could get to come with him um, under the guise of maybe like, oh, you're sick or something or like, hey, I have drugs or what, like whatever he basically got to lure them back to his, you know, killing field. And then um, they did bury them, Dantex. The ones that were identified were actually buried in proper cemeteries. I believe Flo Palillo is buried in... Uh, She's buried in Cleveland. Um, there's another, I think Edward Androssi was buried in another cemetery. Um, but the ones that were not identified were all buried in unmarked graves in pot, in a potter's field. So they were buried, but they were just kind of buried in mass in a, an unmarked grave, which is really kind of crummy. Yeah, imagine if they could do forensic tests on the body parts now. Yeah, it's too, <laughs> I'm looking for just a leg or a fish. Are you looking for a leg or a fish? Maybe, maybe. So, um, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. Like I said, it was a uh, kind of threw you into the, uh, the gory stuff right off the bat. Didn't give you too much warning, but I tried to. So. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. It was done by request. It was a fun one to do. Um, it was a fun one to put together. <laughs> Luna gets some kitty cake. She keeps interrupting. So she might just get a birthday spanking instead because she's being a bad girl. Like I had to turn the microphone off because she decided she was going to grab her toy and just like sing to everyone. And I was like, nobody wants to hear you sing right now. <laughs> People are watching about murders. No one wants to hear you sing. Stop it. They can hear you sing another time. Um, so thanks guys. Thanks for watching. And hopefully soon um, I will have the Manson final part of the cult documentary completed um, and ready for your engagement and enjoyment. And so it'll be fun. It's a lot. There's 17 pages of notes, dude. Like, guys, 17 pages of notes. Like, it's it's a fun one. Uh, there's a lot of material there, and it's one that everybody knows, but I like to try to throw some maybe things in there that people don't know about. So we'll see. We'll see if I kind of test your metal on that one. And uh, thanks, you guys, for joining. Again, all you have to do to support the channel, you can always follow the link. Do, thank you, Susan. Um, and Anne-Marie did send me a PayPal earlier. So thank you for the lovely PayPal donations. It is always appreciated, never required. Um, and then go ahead and like, click like, give that thumbs up, give a comment, share that video out to anybody that you think will enjoy it, um, that likes true crime, that is the easiest thing you can do to support the channel is to share it out. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Stay spooky and try not to get murdered and don't lose your torso. Like don't, just don't do that. Okay. Good night, everybody. Have a good one.